We have to build stronger communities and communities are comprised of people. They're comprised of businesses. They're comprised of neighborhoods. If we can start there, we can change the world, literally. We can change the world. From Fiori Communications, it's How I Got Here, a show of inspiring stories from Tallahassee area leaders, business owners, and neighbors, all the challenges, opportunities, inspirations, the twists and turns of life that led them to where they are today. Everyone has a story worth telling, and I am really grateful that we get to bring a few of them to you. I truly have been changed by my conversations with these amazing people, and I'm confident you will be too. I'm Dave Fiore, and in this episode, I speak with Keith Bowers, Regional Director for the Florida Small Business Development Center at Florida A&M University. A native of Panama City, Florida, Keith was raised in a home that stressed the importance of education and serving others, values he has demonstrated throughout his adult life. He served his country in the U.S. Army Reserves and underserved communities back home with affordable housing programs and connecting small businesses with valuable tools and resources. Keith is a husband, father, and collector of vintage jazz recordings and memorabilia who loves to spend time with family and friends in the kitchen, trying new recipes, and enjoying time together. We started with how Keith would describe himself today. I care about my community. I'm proud of my background and my upbringing. Real appreciative and blessed to have have been born in to the family and community that I was born into in Panama City. And I um, really strive to help other people be the best that they can be, whether it's professionally, personally, or or otherwise. So you grew up in Panama City. Yes. Tell me about those early years. What was family life like for you? Um, Family life was, was, was pretty interesting. Um, My father was an educator for a number of years. Um, he was. He started off as a as a science teacher, science and math teacher. As early as I can remember, he was teaching. And my mother was a um, a social worker, and um, she worked for at that time it was HRS, but is you know now the Department of Children and Families. And so, just growing up in in that environment, you know, um, my dad eventually became a principal. And but in a small community like Panama City, education was the key. And even more so that my dad was involved, you know, in the education system. So, you know, most of my teachers knew my dad and they knew how to, how to contact him directly. So they had no discipline problems out of me and, <laughs> and, my, and my sister. And then so my dad always instilled that education was the key that could unlock any door. Um, and there were no limits, and that was something that no one could take away from you. My mother, being a, a social worker, she placed foster children in homes. So when um, kids and families ran, on, ran into hard times, um, her job was to um, take those kids and find them a suitable environment until things, until you know, things could get you know back on track with the family. And a lot of times, um, when she could not find foster parents, um, those kids stayed with us, whether it was you know for a couple of days or a couple of weeks. So from that perspective, I always had an appreciation that you know. I was blessed and, you know, I, people had it much worse than I did. But it also, you know, allowed me to understand that it's important how you handle adversity. Because I see these kids that were bouncing around from home to home, but, you know, they still, you know, in most instances maintain pretty good um, spirits. They were very ha- happy and grateful for the assistance that my mom was providing and the, the family that was receiving them. But at the same time, you know, they wanted to see their original family be made whole. So it, it just kind of gave me a, a perspective that, you know, you didn't necessarily see on the Brady Bunch or, or you know, television shows at, uh, uh, at that time. So what was that like having different kids in and out of your house like that was... I mean, that, I'm sure that had some impact on you. Yeah. Sometimes you'd probably get close to them. Other times they probably 
irritated yeah. you? Yeah, I mean, yeah. What, what was that like? Yeah, it was it was a mixed bag because um, yeah. some of the kids had you know they were they were really hard or they just didn't open up. It was really hard to kind of communicate with them. Um, in some instances, the kids were were great, and um, but my mom basically made sure that they were all treated just as we were treated, as, as our kids were treated. So again, and um, you know, just being patient and tolerable and and understanding was was the was the key takeaway from that. But um, at times, it got pretty it got pretty challenging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tell me about your mom. She sounds like she's pretty special and that that, I mean, I know that that's not necessarily part of her job to personally right. take care of the children she couldn't place. Right. So what was it about her that kind of felt the desire and the heart to bring kids into her own home like that? Well, her philosophy, and she shared this with, with us at an early age, is basically kids didn't do anything to, to be in that position. Right. Kids didn't choose to be there. Kids didn't choose that environment, and kids really didn't control what happened, you know, to them on a day to day basis. So basically, she she took that as you know these are these are all God's children, and they deserve every every um, benefit and the utmost respect um, of anyone, regardless of the circumstances. And that's just the the you know, persona that that she embodied for a number of years to this day. I mean, she retired numbers of years ago, but to this day, she'll call me and ask if my son Winton has any um, clothes that he's outgrown because she's trying to help a family over in Panama City. Right. You know. So um, that never stopped. It never, never stopped. No. Right. That's amazing. And how about your dad? Was he on on board with this? Yeah, my dad was on board too because yeah. he was, um, you know, at that time um, when he first started teaching, the schools in Panama City was segregated, and so um, you know he he taught um, you know African American kids, and um, this was back when they were supposedly separate but equal, and he realized that it was his responsibility to give them. A, a class A education, you know, regardless of what zip code they were in or what the color of their skin was. So right. he was he was no nonsense. Um, he demanded a lot from his students. He pushed them very very hard. He demanded respect. You know, my dad was uh, he was a, a trailblazer over in Panama City. I mean, going through civil rights and advocating for different things for the African American community. He he understood that it was not just our family, it was a larger family outside of of our house. Right, right. Yeah. Was he directly involved in any of the desegregation? I mean, did he have students bus to his school or was he yeah. involved in that process? Yes. After desegregation, there were some students that came to the school that he was working at, which had historically been a, um, a school for African-American kids. Parents did not like the fact that their kids left their neighborhood to go to a black school mm-hmm. and were being taught by black um, uh, teachers and had black principals. So th- that was a challenge. And then later on, he became a principal, and um, one of the schools that he was sent to was uh, in a white community. And he got a lot of blowback from, from parents there, but, you know, he, he persevered. He, he saw that education um, was colorless and um, opportunities, you know, were colorless, and he had a job to do, and he was going to do it. Sounds like a pretty amazing guy. Yeah, he was. He yeah. was. Yeah. Yeah. Did that have any influence on you as you looked at education or or growing up and and understanding his background and what he had gone through? Yes, it it definitely did because I, we were constantly reminded when we left the house that we were representing my my mother and my father and mm. the entire Bowers family and moreover African Americans across the the country and I always joke that you know that was a lot of pressure on a kid headed out the door for kindergarten, but that's, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's that's when it started. So yes, we took you know we 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 took um, education very seriously, and um, so you couldn't be a bad student. You couldn't mess up. I messed up, and um, I wasn't the best student, but I did not have any discipline problems. And we had to take the opportunities 
seriously. We had to be respectful. There was right. no no such thing as talking back to the teacher or any any adult for that matter. But yeah, all of all of the things that that I learned growing up in Panama City definitely impacted me and sort of um, prepared me for greater things. Right. So what what kind of things did you like to do as a kid outside of school or in school? I, I liked playing different sports. I never I wasn't really like a team sport person, but you know, on after school and the weekends played football, basketball, got into tennis at a, a pretty early age and started playing tennis. But what I, I think I was very, very interested in was music. And I, not that I had played an instrument, but I, I loved um, collecting music, and I still collect music to this day. Um, I love earn, uh, understanding and learning about the artist, um, just the the process of of um, pulling music together was was just real intriguing to me. So that was one of the things I used to spend. Like if I got some money, I'd go down to the record store and get a get a forty five and. Right. And that's how I spent my, my allowance. And every every chance I got, I was listening to music. So what kinds of music did you like? In Panama City, we had uh, only... Uh, country. Country, absolutely. <laughs> right. <laughs> we had country and we had um, a radio station that played classic rock. Okay. And then on the weekends, the, the college station in town... We had um, from Saturday, Saturday morning from about 8 o'clock until noon, we had R&B. We had one college DJ that would, would play R&B. So there so was one window that was to one hear window. R&B. Exactly. Right. It was one window to hear R&B. I fell in love with jazz when I was like a senior in high school. Um, really got into to jazz, and, and that's what I listen to mostly now. Those are pretty diverse types of music. I know R&B has roots in jazz and ties to that. Right. So what, what do you think drew you to jazz? Because that's... It's probably not the most typical genre of music for a high school student to listen to. Well, it's interesting. Um, I, I stumbled upon jazz. The Cosby Show was really popular when I was in high school. Right. So every Thursday it would come on, and I would be glued to the television watching the Cosby Show. And so the son on the Cosby Show, Theo, Theo, yeah, yeah he had a poster in his room of Wynton Marcellus, and I was like, I wonder who that guy is. I did some some research and went to the uh, record store and right. realized that he had at that time he had probably about twenty albums and in classical and jazz and so I um, bought one of his albums at the time and ever since then I was I was hooked and in fact my son is named Winton right after, after Winton Marcellus yeah. so um, that's how I, I got into jazz and as you mentioned you know I realized that after studying um, a lot of jazz and just the history of jazz I realized that is really the birthplace of music and yeah. in, in, in American music and it was so interesting because it was most of it was was improv which I loved, you know, it's like something different every time. Right. And that was a big difference for, you know, you listen to a a jazz performance and the solo artist got a chance to do their thing and shine um, compared to R&B where you you pretty much have the same melody, the same beat, same chorus. But this one was, it was, it was so sophisticated that I, I really, really found it interesting. Yeah. Did you have any friends in high school who enjoyed jazz with you? No. <laughs> no. You were, I, was, I was the only, only one. You were it, right? Yeah. And at that time, I mean, you, the only way you could really listen to it was with records. Right. right. Yeah. Because there, there, was, there wasn't a de- college DJ with nope. a jazz hour. No. Right? It's funny because when I started listening to jazz, my dad heard some of it. And he's like, I didn't know you liked jazz. And he took me to where he had stored all of his Vinyl stuff. I mean, Dave Brubrick, Miles Davis, the Lionel, Lionel Hampton, yeah, um, Duke Ellington. I mean, he was like, and he had all that. He had all of that. Wow. And we never, we never even talked about it. I mean, it was just something that I was, you know, listening to. And he was like, you know, who, who is that? And I was like, that's Winter Marcellus. And he goes, he sounds a lot like Lee Morgan. And I was like, who's Lee Morgan? <laughs> and then <laughs> he's like, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, what a nice connection there to, yeah, to have, yeah. yeah. So you went to Bay High School, yes, right in Panama City. In Panama City. How was high school for you? 
High school was great. I had a great time in high school. I uh, really enjoyed, um, first of all, Bay High was within walking distance from my house. But Bay High was is the oldest high school in Panama City. And traditionally, more um, affluent kids came to Bay. And so it was interesting because, you know, it was in a African-American neighborhood but you had people coming from affluent parts of town, and at that right. time they didn't have a high school at the beach, so you, the beach was growing, so you had kids coming from, from all over. So it was a great way to get exposed to a lot of different people. I was a class um, vice president for Bay High, you know, my 10th, 11th, and 12th grade year. Got involved in Air Force ROTC, was part of the Key Club, um, the Student Senate. And it was just a good platform for me to to um, express who I was. So that was my f- sort of like a coming out party for me in politics. Um, if I was going to be successful, I had to make sure that I made my rounds and talked to everybody. Right. And so um, and figure so it out- pushed you to to maybe move out of your comfort zone exactly. a little bit. Exactly. It pushed me from out of this what I consider this pigeonhole to something that was much larger. It exposed me to a lot of different ways of thinking and a lot of different cultures. Hmm. Were you a beach kid at all? No. Not at all? Not you at never all. made the trip across the bay? Every now and then. Yeah. It was sort of, um, the beach was there. It was this beautiful destination for a lot of folks. Um, but when I was growing up, the, the legacy of the beach, it was segregated. There were only certain places that, that um, black families could go on the beach, and one was the National State Park, uh, St. Andrews National St. State Andrews, Park. Yeah. yeah, that was one place where the jetties are. There. Right, I love that place. Yeah. yeah, it's beautiful. That was the only place black people could go. I had no idea. And um, so it was kind of bittersweet. Like I said, you know, you had everybody coming from around the world to enjoy this beach, but I still remember, you know, my mom taking us to the beach and. We'd always go into this, you know, pretty less than, I would say less than a thousand square feet of, of, of this right. massive area. As I got older and understood why, I just didn't have a strong um, affinity to, to the beach hmm. then. So we, even obviously when you were growing up, it wasn't segregated anymore, no, but was there was still that, the legacy and that, the baggage attached to that. Right. It was still sort of like the... You, you shouldn't be here. Um, really? Yeah. It was still, you still got a feeling that you shouldn't, you shouldn't be here or don't stay here too long. You needed to get back across the bridge at a certain point of time because, you know, there were, my mom would tell me stories about kids older than me that things did not go well for them um, because they were at the beach. I mean, that was still within the time that you were yes. going to the beach. Right. Yes. Right. It's just really hard to believe. Yeah. So you leave Panama City to come to Tallahassee. Right. And um, attend Florida A&M University. Yes. How did you end up at FAMU? I wanted to go, originally I wanted to go to school in um, Louisiana at Southern University. I was in junior ROTC when I was in high school, and I really wanted to, you know, get an ROTC because I thought I wanted to be an, an officer I thought I wanted a career as an officer in the Army okay. or the Air Force at that time. I realized that when I did not get a scholarship to Southern, that um, out-of-state tuition was about four times as much. <laughs> it's, it's pricey. <laughs> yeah. And, and my father brought that to my my um, my recollection. <laughs> and, yeah. um, and so we looked around at different schools, I um, and I— Come to FAMU for football games. Um, yeah, some of my family's um, members had gone to FAMU, and so we'd always come up over for a game or homecoming. I was just always amazed too, because you know, coming from a majority white high school to a, a HBCU, where right. you know you see a lot of folks that look like you and sound like you. Um, quite frankly, I I was like, I'm not sure if I'm ready for this. I'm not sure if I can. In what way? I was, um, like I said, coming from a you know leadership position all throughout high school, and 
coming and now being a, a a little fish in a big pond, I was like, I would much rather go to a, a majority school where I'm just, you know, one of the numbers. And now I'm around, you know, everybody who was pretty much had my background, but I didn't know that. You know, you didn't, you really didn't have a lot of information on student population, where for folks were coming from and, you know, what comprised the, the student population. But I was a little intimidated about coming to FAMU until I realized that um, I talked to some other students that were ahead of me. My sister started off at FAMU, and she did she did a year at FAMU and then transferred to FSU. And so I was like, well, I wonder if that's what's going to happen. But right. um, I got to FAMU and um, fell in love with it, met my, my best friend the first day when we were both moving in. And realized that he was, we had very, very similar backgrounds. He was from Little Rock, Arkansas. They only had a, a soft rock radio station. <laughs> so we, 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 right. we bonded quickly. And, we, and, and then I started to realize that, you know, a lot of these folks um, share a similar background as, as me. And I have started to um, get very, very comfortable with the environment at FAMU. So what are those similarities you're talking about as far as having a similar background? In what uh, way? Sort of being, a, you know, above average student from their high school, family having the same um, standards and expectations, not being rich, but, you know, middle class and still had a desire to, um, to exploit uh, a, a education. Again, it was like a lot of folks that felt and, and believed the same things that I believed. And you studied business and economics? Yes. Right? What yeah. led you to those fields of study? <laughs> wow, this is uh, <laughs> this is really how I got there. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll tell you a quick story. I was, uh, I was the whole time I was in, in high school, I was working. I worked part-time at a restaurant. I was a, a, a short order cook at a steakhouse. And um, my dad insisted that I, you know, manage my finances. And so I had a, a checking account. Um, I had a car loan, you know, all in my name. A lot of adult kind a of stuff. A lot of adult, right, a lot of adult kind of things. I had to yeah. pay my own insurance and things of that nature. And so um, one day I was um, going from, I'd just gotten paid, and I was going to deposit my check at the credit union. And when I got to the credit union, I um, endorsed my check and put it in there. And the lady told me how much money I had in my account. And she said, Mr. Bowers, do you think you may want to um, open a CD? And I was like, okay, um, so what's the difference between a CD and a savings account? And she was like, at that time, it was paying like a a lot of interest. Yeah, yeah, CDs were paying a lot. So I said, um, yeah. So I transferred my money from my a portion of my money from my my checking and savings account into a CD and I felt like a business person. <laughs> I was like, you <laughs> that know, it was a very mature thing right, to do. Yeah, right? exactly. I was like I went home and told my dad what I had done. He told me, you know, was, he was he was proud of me and he then told me that he wanted me to meet um one of his friends who was uh the bank president at the local bank. And he goes, you know, you really, if you really want to understand how money works, I want you to meet this guy. And um, so I went in, sat down and talked to him, and he explained, you know, how the banking system worked, the advantages of, of saving money. Uh, and then when, as he was talking, I was intrigued that he seemed to be doing very well <laughs> dealing with other people's money. You know, that's what made me want to go into banking um, or into business. And I knew that business... Uh, business education, and economics education was a pathway to banking. Okay. Yeah. So you were kind of intrigued with the whole idea of managing money, helping people manage their money as right. a career. As a career. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And I saw that, I saw that the, the power that money had, because it was so strange that, you know, when, when my dad would go to, he had to go borrow money. It was like a big deal. You know, he was like, I got to make sure I have this and I'm going to wear a nice uh, suit and I'm going to have all my paper 
um, in order and I've got all the questions answered and, you know, it, it was a big deal. Right. And so I, I realized, you know, he was, when he was there, he really respected the person on the other side of that desk. And it was important because having access to money is everything. It's everything. Um, it, it opens up so many doors for you. That's that's why I, I chose to, to study business. Always fascinating to me how little, sometimes even kind of a random collection of inputs into your life can yeah. impact you so much. Yeah. And I'm um, from seeing a, a jazz poster in Theo Huxtable's right. room, you know, <laughs> right. to, to opening up a CD. All right. So in addition to um, studying, you also continued your ROTC, right? Yes. In, in college. And you were, um, you left FAMU as a uh, commissioned as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army. Right. Then you served in the Army Reserves. And uh, how long did you serve after you graduated? 14 years in the wow. Army, Army Reserves. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I saw that you spent time in uh, Guantanamo Bay and also Bosnia. Yes. So uh, tell me about those experiences. And those that's also the same time as the first Gulf War, right, was going on? Um, it was between the Gulf Wars. We went to Bosnia as part of a peacekeeping mission with the United Nations after uh, former Yugoslavia um, had come under attack. You had the civil war um, right. that was taking place in that region. And um, at that time, I was a, uh, in a postal unit. We were deployed to continue postal operations for the soldiers that were deployed there. And it was an interesting time. Um, this was during the Clinton administration, sniper attacks for for armed personnel there, folks that were identified as, as soldiers um, would come under sniper attacks. There were landmines all over the place. So it was... It was pretty um, tumultuous yeah. when, when when we got there. I worked at the main post office, and I ran the post office, um, and I had seven outlying post offices that we had to— we got the, the mail at the central location, and then we had to disperse it and deliver it to these outlying areas. And so it was interesting because the first day I got there, and they were giving me sort of like an orientation— you know, I had on a full, they call it full battle rattle. You've got your flap jacket, your your steel pot, your your, your nine, helmet. Yeah, yeah, right. your, your your yeah, your helmet, your, your nine millimeter, you got extra rounds, you've got all So you're ready for anything. Anything. And I realized that, you know, and, and they said, Well, we're gonna go to um, one of the outlying areas. And so I'm thinking that we're just gonna, you know, hop into a, a Humvee or something. Um, and get across there. But when I, when they, we started walking outside, there were six Humvees that were all lined up in a row. The one in the front had a um, 60 caliber machine gun, and the one in the back had a 60 caliber machine gun. And everybody was dressed as I was and had, you know, more ammunition. I mean, they were, right. we were really prepared. And so it, it, at that point— um, Did it kind of sink in where kinda, you were? Yeah, it, it, it got yeah. very, very surreal. The, the first day we, the, the first day on that trip, we stopped, and there was like a checkpoint. Had a report that there had been some activity, some mine activity. So we had to send guys out there to sort of scan the area that we were about to cross mm -hmm. um, for mines. And I realized that, you know— Every day, we were basically putting our lives at risk to deliver mail. <laughs> yeah. and um, But I also realized how important that job was. A soldier to hear um, from his loved ones from back home or to receive a care package. And they were, if I'm taking them mail on the front lines, then technically a they they have it worse than I do, <laughs> right? You right. know, and that's the way I started looking at it. But it was um, still scary, right? It was very very unnerving. Um, huge huge um, point in my life where I realized that life is precious. You know, one day I'm working at a bank in Panama City, you know, making loans to business folks and other people, and then two weeks later, I'm smack dab in the middle of Bosnia. Um, <laughs> You're making a mail run in full right, gear, right, right? Right, That's crazy. And it being part of the reserves, how long were you over there 
Yeah. Um, nine months. When you were going through classes and training and, and working or being part of ROTC, did the reality of what that would mean, did you understand that no. at the time? At the time, there was no threat when I got commissioned. Um, the Soviet Union had had fallen. There was because when the whole time I was in ROTC, we were we were training um, to combat Russia, and then when the Soviet Union fell um, and they were weakened, we we're like, well, this is we we really don't have any um, geopolitical threats out there. So no, it was. So you it, thought your timing was good? I as thought far as exactly. That goes, right? I, I thought it was great because <laughs> you know they paid for my college, and I'm like, all I right. got to do is show up a one the weekend. The world is happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> And also, you spent time in Guantanamo Bay. Yes, um, after nine eleven, the detainees were were held in Guantanamo Bay, famously. Yes, yeah, and so I I got there the second the second wave of of folks de- were deployed. So what made the headlines was Camp X Ray, which um, you know they were they had less than desirable. Um, accommodations and facilities for the detainees. And, you know, there were stories of abuse and things of that nature. And when I got there, the, the new general um, was on the, on the ground. And we were really focusing on adhering to the Geneva Convention, which, you know, provides rights to all prisoners of war. And that was my job, was to make sure that we were adhering to all of their cultural and um, religious practices and make sure they had Qurans, prayer beads, prayer mats, and just a liaison with the International Red Cross. How did that impact your relationship with the rest of your Army colleagues? It was difficult because a lot of folks felt that, you know, they're prisoners of war. Right. Um, they should be treated like prisoners— they may not deserve those comforts and right, right. allowances. Exactly. Um, so we always had to reiterate that, you know, we are a nation that adheres to the Geneva Convention, you know, under every circumstance and um, had a zero tolerance um, for anybody that that tried to operate otherwise. I, I learned a lot from both of those um, deployments, and the key takeaway is and I kind of think back to what my mom, because my mom would write me constantly um, while I was deployed. She's like, no, no matter where you land, you still are who you are. So, you know, you don't you don't change. Is it hard to remember that sometimes? Yes. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Thank you for your service, by the way. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah, Thanks. I appreciate I mean, that. I have great respect for people who are willing to go over, protect our country, and and, um, provide those services. So thank you. You're very welcome. Hey, everybody. I'm very pleased and proud to announce that How I Got Here is now sponsored by Socially Loved TLH. When I realized that the podcast may actually be getting listened to, I wanted to find a partner that would have the same general goals and benefit from reaching our local audience. That's why I'm so excited about connecting you with Socially Loved TLH. You have probably seen their books around town for years, but wait till you see what's coming in April. It's a similar concept, reinvented in a new and exciting way. Socially Loved and How I Got Here are both interested in spreading encouragement and inspiration throughout the community that helps us understand each other just a little bit better. I encourage you to be part of their new Facebook group, Socially Loved by TLH. Just search it, answer a few questions, and you're in. Join your neighbors, including me, who are already on board and sharing stories about the people and places that make Tallahassee special. Check it out today. Again, that's Socially Loved by TLH on Facebook. Thanks again for listening. Now back to the show. All right, so the also while you were in the reserves, I assume you had some regular job, right? Yes. You were working. Now, is that when you were at... Um, the, is that when you were at People's First Community the, Bank? I was deployed at... When I was um, working at People's First, I got deployed to Bosnia. Okay. And um, yes. So my, my job at People's First, I was the Community Reinvestment Act officer. My responsibility was to make sure that the bank was providing financial services to historically underserved communities. And um, back in the 60s and 70s and early 80s, 
Um, there was a really bad problem with banks denying credit for certain areas. They would, it was called redlining. They find an area in town and different communities, and they would draw a red line. And instructions were to loan officers that we don't make loans in this in these in these areas. So um, it disenfranchised a lot of African American and Hispanic communities. So there was a regulation called the Community Reinvestment Act, which stated that if a bank takes deposits from the community, they also have to provide financial services to that same community. That makes sense. Right. Uh, we can't just take the money. Right. We have to give some back. We have to give right. some back. Right. And so that was my job was to make sure that our um, financial institution was adhering to the spirit of the law. Okay. Yeah. And is that part of the affordable housing program? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, I've developed an affordable housing program for um, first-time home buyers. Um, that made it easier for them to qualify for uh, so a loan. lower down payment, better interest rate, right? Um, for first time buyers, for first time home buyers, that's right. I think we really did some amazing work there for underserved communities. We um, even took it a step further uh, because um, there was no one that was developing affordable housing. Everybody was developing housing for rental, but not affordable housing to sell. So we paired up with a nonprofit, provided them funds to go out and build affordable housing. And um, we were there to help them and got other banks and formed a consortium of lenders. And as these houses were built and buyers were qualified, banks would be in line to make the make the mortgage loans. You mean a Habitat for Humanity kind of group? or No, it was not a Habitat for Humanity Um didn't involve any um, sweat equity. Okay. But it Just was. Just what kind of nonprofit? I mean, a nonprofit that builds affordable housing? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The, yeah. A nonprofit that specializes in community development and they, they would hire different contractors and the contractors would, would build the houses. The, the nonprofit would buy the lots. We would make the construction loans mm-hmm. available. Why do you think? I mean, obviously, if there are people willing to buy the houses, and they can get the loans, why would you have to go through a nonprofit to get those built? I'm surprised that there wouldn't be a, a commercial builder who would be interested in building those kind of houses. Well, commercial builders, they, they make more money on larger houses. Um, still, a lot of they're going to go through the same logistics and pouring a slab and putting up the framing and you know closing in the house. Um, but if it's a 1,500-square-foot house and they've got an opportunity to do the same thing for a 3,000, 4,000 square foot house, the numbers uh, right. for them make a lot more sense. With upgrades on flooring and exactly. cabinets and counters yeah. and everything right. else. Right, right. Yeah. So I imagine you got a lot of fulfillment from that. I mean, you were your job was directly impacting families and providing opportunities. Yes. I mean, how did that make you feel? Oh, it was, it was the one of the best feelings I ever had working in that environment. I think at the time I was... 25 oh, wow. and, um, <laughs> and having people stop me in the grocery store. It's like, you helped me buy my first house or, you know, um, I never thought I could do it. The fact that I was in a position that was blessed to be in a position to help someone realize their dream and to do something that they never could imagine that they could do was, was just an awesome feeling. Yeah, awesome feeling. I was home in Panama City this past weekend, and I drove by the first subdivision that our that nonprofit built, and to see that there are still kids out, you know, running in front of the houses and and um, families occupying those houses is just something that never goes away. Yeah, so, that must be great. Yeah, yeah. So your your next move was to the Florida Housing Finance Corporation, right? And that that's in Tallahassee. Yes, right. So tell me about that move and how you ended up here. After I got back from from Bosnia, um, and you know, like I said, putting your life on the line every day sort of changes your perspective, and sure. you start to think, well, there's a bigger world out there. And although my my program at at um, People's First, I was you know able to impact um, communities in Bay County and other um, surrounding counties, I felt like I had a, a higher calling, a bigger you know, if I could if I could do something on that scale in Panama City, what's the next level? One of my um, dad's 
close friends was on the board at Florida Housing Finance Corporation. And when I got back from Bosnia, he said, hey, you know, they've got some positions open and I really want you to come by and meet the people there are involved in affordable housing, but they're they're doing it across the state on a much larger scale. And so I um, came over and sat down and talked with the folks and realized that, you know, this is a great opportunity. Yeah. And so um, I left the bank and moved to Tallahassee to work at Florida Housing Finance Corporation. And did that, were you able to achieve what you'd hoped you would be able to do? Yes. My portfolio at the bank was probably $3 million in affordable housing um, at the bank at the time. And when I started working at Florida Housing, their annual budget for um, affordable housing was probably about a quarter of a billion dollars. In, so that's a big in, jump. In, in single, yes. And it, it gave me an opportunity to work with different lenders um, across the entire state. And that included uh, a HUD program, right? A, a federal program for affordable housing? Right. We were awarded the contract to administer um, the HUD home program, which provided down payment and closing cost assistance for um, first-time home buyers. That was a great program, and um, that, uh, again, spurred a lot of development in some of your, your um, harder-to-develop urban areas. So how long were you at uh, Florida Housing? Probably six and a half years. Okay. That's when I got deployed to go to Guantanamo Bay. When I came back, again, another epiphany. Um, you know, coming back from Cuba after 9-11, no one knew what the future held for the country at that time. And everything that we thought— that we could count on was erased, you know, in one afternoon. And so when I came back from Guantanamo Bay, I said, well, I wanted to start my own company. I've done this on a massive scale for a a private institution. I've done it on a massive scale for uh, a public institution. What would it be like if I were just to roll up my sleeves and get out there and go, you know, set up my own shop yeah. And see what I can do. Um, because I did see that there was a, a gap. Um, and some, so even though Florida Housing did, does a really good job, I felt that some of the the product that some of the builders were, were constructing and some of the areas that they were still kind of steering clear of needed some attention. So I took my Rolodex and, <laughs> um, and started my own um, consulting company. Right. Yeah. The Bowers Group. The Bowers Group, right. Right. I know from experience how scary hanging out oh, your own shingle can oh my be gosh, yeah. and uh, leaving the protection of another employer and all that. So how did that go? I mean, how, you know, from the beginning, did did that Rolodex hunting help or did, uh, did yeah. it take some time to get cranked it, up? It, it took a little time to get cranked up. Um, it took a little time to get cranked up. I, I started my company and I didn't have any clients. I reached back into my Rolodex and there were a few different clients that were still wondering what happened to me, you know? Mm -hmm. And so they reached out and they didn't have any work for me at the time, but, you know, we still talked about what I was planning to do and where I wanted to, to what impact I wanted to make. Sooner or later, I got a call from, from one organization and said that we're interested in building a small scale affordable housing. Can you help us get money from Florida Housing Finance Corporation to do it. And so that was my first consulting um, gig. When I formed a Bowers Group, it was for community and economic development. The, uh, the affordable housing part was the community development. The economic development was a piece that I wanted to focus on because I was going to leverage my banking background and see how we could get um, capital infused into those communities that needed it. And so I started thinking about starting a credit union in um, Frenchtown. It was a crazy idea. And so I went and talked to uh, Reverend R.B. Holmes about it. He's like, let's do it. I think it's a great idea and let's do it. So um, Reverend R.B. Holmes was my second client. (laughs) And um, we started the process of chartering uh, a credit union, um, low-income credit union in Frenchtown, that would provide um, an alternative to um, payday lenders and, and predatory lenders. Right. Yeah. So 
explain that a little bit the, for those who don't have a traditional relationship with a bank or a credit union. They would often finance their lives through payday right. loans and you know, kind of always moving things around, yes. swapping credit, paying huge interest rates, exactly, and never developing any stability. Exactly, right? that was that was the main problem. Yeah, and, and especially in, in in underserved minority communities, um, the most recognizable financial institution is often a, a payday loan place or a pawn shop. And I just felt that there needed to be a way to break that that cycle. So that's when we started thinking about having a, a financial institution that would be um, rooted in financial literacy, making sure people understood how to manage money and credit, and then would also provide an opportunity because, you know, people talk about financial literacy and they stop there. They don't talk about the putting a dollar. I learned how to read because somebody gave me a book, not because I watched Dave Fiore read. <laughs> so, right. so how would I learn how to become financially literate unless somebody gave me some, some money? Right. Right. And I learned that, ex- you know, I had the experience of managing that money and the responsibility of repaying that money. So I always felt that that was what was missing. You know, financial literacy is a very strong resource, but it has to be coupled with with money. Right. And you were fortunate to learn that again at a young age. At a very with, young with your age. Bank. Exactly. Right. So how did that go? Um, it didn't go so well. At the time we were we worked through the application process and um, when we submitted our application, it was the worst time to submit because it was two thousand eight. Mm-hmm. So it was right before the big crash. I went back and told Reverend Holmes that you know we gotta figure out another way to make this happen. And so um, Reverend Holmes reached out to um, some folks at FSU. FSU's credit union said, well, we're interested in your concept. So why don't you let us run with it? And then they brought in Envision Credit Union. Right. And they started the Frenchtown Financial Opportunity Center. Do you think any progress has been made as far as moving people into a a better financial arrangement with a uh, financial institution at some point? Definitely. Definitely. Like I said, having having access to capital means the world. I mean, a lot of folks couldn't have gone to college unless their, their parents took out a, a second mortgage on their home, mm-hmm. right? And they had to have the wherewithal to do that. Uh, businesses would not have been started unless people had some type of capital or or credit or in the capacity to do it. So it, it takes your trajectory up exponentially having access to capital and the wherewithal to manage it. Right. Then in 2010, you were hired as the regional director for the Florida Small Business Development Center at Florida A&M University. For those who are not familiar with the SBDC, please just give me a quick overview. What's its role and what do you do there? Well, we provide consulting services and technical assistance to small business owners and entrepreneurs. If it's a new company, we basically help them figure out if they've got the correct business model, if their if their business has any chance of, of making it. For those established businesses, we take a deeper dive into their business model. We we help them analyze their financial statements. We help them with cash flow management, market research. We run a pretty uh, full-service uh, business support center. Yeah. And I just want to touch on a few things to put in context what S- the SBDC means to this region. Um, I pulled some some facts that uh, actually you gave me, which okay. is helpful. So hopefully they're right. Since you've been there, SBDC has helped businesses in the panhandle create or retain more than 9,000 jobs increased sales of their clients by more than $1 billion, helped clients secure $163 million in government contracts, helped clients obtain $27 million in loans to help their businesses grow, and helped start more than 150 businesses. Yeah. That's pretty significant impact. Yeah, yeah. I'm really, really happy with the work that my team and I have, have been able to accomplish. I think it's important that the statistics that you read, because we've got clients that have been in existence for over 25 years that we see on a regular basis because they want to get better. 
What does it feel like when you reconnect with somebody you've helped a few years ago and, you, you know, you run into them and they're doing well and they're thriving? That's got to yeah. be a pretty awesome feeling. Yeah, it is. Very, very rewarding um, feeling for me um, personally because I've walked in their shoes and I know how hard it is. But to see them successful and to see their business thrive and to see them hire more folks or open um, new stores or um, get government contracts and people call me all the time and say, you know, I, I got the contract. And it's like, I mean, I celebrate right along with them. It's like, yes. Right. Um, but it is very rewarding. To me, it seems like what you're doing now with small business is just a continuation of what you did with affordable housing, right? You're helping, you're connecting people with opportunities, assets, programs, um, information that allows them to make good decisions and move their life forward in a positive way. So do you see that as kind of a one big arc that's just kind of pivoted a little bit along the way? Definitely. I, I see there is a lot of correlation um, in all of my background and, and experiences. I, I see um, it is a continuation of helping people understand that there's a way to go about getting your business started. There's a way about going about getting your making your business successful. The the most important thing you could do for somebody else is let them know how much you care about them and and how much you're willing to help them. And I think once you can convince them that you know you are completely vested in in their dreams, it it makes it a lot easier. That has sort of been my my underlying theme. We have to build stronger communities. And communities are comprised of people. They're comprised of businesses. They're comprised of neighborhoods. If we can start there, we can change the world. Literally, we can change the world. I just want to shift a little bit and um, talk about your personal life a little bit more. You, um, okay. I want to ask you about your wife, Valerie. Yes. Been married 14 years. 14 years. Tell me about her. Well, Valerie is a accomplished filmmaker. She currently works at the um, film school at Florida State. But prior to coming to Florida State, she worked in Hollywood for Warner Brothers. Um, she worked at Oprah Winfrey's um, Harpo Film Production Company. And she loves telling stories. So she found a really great home at Florida State because she gets to to tell help her students tell stories uh, every semester. Yeah. Um, but she and I were introduced. One of my clients, they asked me if I wanted to um, come over and meet her sister and sister-in-law. I was like, sure. So I went over and I met Valerie um, at the time, but she was working in Los Angeles and I was working in Panama City. So I was like, this is probably not going to go anywhere. And then uh, about 10 years later, I got a consulting engagement in Los Angeles. So I called um, her brother-in-law at the time and said, well, I'm going to be out in L.A. for about three weeks. It'd be great if I could just, you know, connect with Valerie so she can kind of, you know, help me navigate the city. It's a pretty right. large place. And so he's like, sure, well, I'll, I'll see if she wants me to give you her phone number. <laughs> so <laughs> smart. Yeah. yeah. So, um we connected while we were there. We went out for sushi and um, started dating after that. And Now, she, when you asked for her phone number, were you interested in her at that point, did you think? No. Or you really I, just I, wanted I, a guy really, for the yeah, city? Yeah, yeah, I just wanted a guy for the city. When we started, you know, talking and realized we had a lot of things in common, and I thought, you know, she was an incredibly smart woman and um, very ambitious and creative. I was like, this might work. So... <laughs> Yeah, so we started we started dating and um, we're married probably three years, a couple of years after after that. And then um, you had your son Winton. Yes, right. Tell me about him. What is what is Winton like? Oh gosh, Winton is um, first of all he's much smarter than me, and uh, uh, he's just a sponge. Um, very creative kid. Uh, a phenomenal artist. He likes music. He plays the trumpet. He plays the guitar. He plays the piano. He plays in the steel drum band at at Raw. And most uh, importantly, does he like jazz? 
No, he does not like <laughs> jazz. <laughs> he says when we ask him about jazz, he goes, "I don't like it yet." Yeah. <laughs> so well, yeah, he might mature so, into right, it. Right, right. I'm right. hoping. I'm hoping that day will be soon. He is um, a 4.0 student and just doing amazingly well. So nice. we're very proud of him. Yeah. All right. So I, I do want to circle back a little bit to your jazz, your love for jazz, and the collections that you have. So just I know you collect recordings, memorabilia. Mm-hmm. Just kind of tell me a little bit about, you know, what you're drawn to, what you like to collect, how you find it all, and and all about that. I like the the jazz really focused on the Harlem Renaissance jazz when you have um, all these folks that were in that same area around the same time. You had um, Dizzy Gillespie, Count Basie, Thelonious Monk, um, Dexter Gordon, um, Lionel Hampton, Max Roach, all these guys if you could throw a rock, you'd probably hit a jazz artist, you know, in Harlem during the Renaissance period. What I'm attracted to was just the how well they have been the curators of the art form and the fact that every jazz, modern jazz musicians always pay homage to the the folks that bridge the gap. I collect postcards, I collect books, um, recordings, and anything that looks cool, <laughs> anything yeah. that looks cool that that lends itself to jazz. I saw that you also love to cook and travel. Do you are you able to do both those things? Yes, yes, definitely. Do you enjoy gourmet cooking or you know I trying say, new things? Or? I like to try new recipes. Yeah. I'm always looking for new recipes and trying to perfect them. I, and I also think cooking is just. It's, it's like jazz. You know, um, you can have a recipe, but you can also improvise. <laughs> you know, right. you can also... Sometimes because you have to. Right, Sometimes exactly. You want to, exactly. Right? You can make it uniquely your own. And um, and it's relaxing. Um, I love seeing people um, enjoy my food and especially pair it with a nice bottle of wine. Um, I just think that it's, you know, one of the best things you could do is sit around the table uh, or even in the kitchen and cook with other people and talk and share stories. And travel too? Do you get to travel much? Yeah, I get to travel. And that's one of the things that, that Valerie's helped me with. Um, she grew up traveling. Um, her dad was in the Peace Corps and they traveled a lot. And um, she's kind of pulled me into traveling a lot with her and just being exposed to different cultures, I think, is, is um, really eye opening. Makes you appreciate Tallahassee a lot. And it also makes you appreciate other places. So it's like you, you're, you've got the best of both worlds. Right. Yeah. Looking back, what is the one thing or person that has changed or altered the trajectory of your life to this point? One person would, would definitely be my dad. I always tell people he was my biggest fan and my harshest critic. <laughs> and I wouldn't have it any other way. He taught me um, a lot about life. He taught me a lot about personal responsibility. He taught me how to overcome systematic racism. And he taught me how to have fun and enjoy life, which is all important ingredients um, um, for, for my existence. All right. And final question. The name of this podcast is How I Got Here. Yes. Um, so where do you think here might be for you in three to five years from now? Here for me would be still working in the community on a larger scale. Not sure if I was, you know, if that means me being here at the, the Small Business Development Center or not. But I know that for me, it would be really trying to make an impact on a larger level. I think uh, everything that we do is basically stepping stones, and I'm not there yet. Um, I'm involved with a lot of community development initiatives right now. We're trying to rebuild Frenchtown Gateway and a development, trying to put a grocery store in Frenchtown, bringing a medical clinic, uh, affordable housing, um, commercial spaces. When you look at all the development that takes place throughout Tallahassee and Leon County, It stops when you get to the south side in in Frenchtown for the most part, um, outside of the things that FSU has been instrumental in doing. But I think real change is going to come when Frenchtown is not 
the poorest community in Leon County or has the highest unemployment rate or the highest um, infant mortality rate. I just think that there's a lot of work to, to be done and I'm just waiting to see, you know, where my feet end up. Right. But uh, it, it, they'll be squarely rooted in, in trying to improve and enhance the quality of life for people who may not have had the, the breaks and opportunities that I've had. That was Keith Bowers. He spent his entire adult life finding ways to improve the lives of those around him and has been pretty darn good at it. I guess if you've delivered mail from an armored vehicle while trying to avoid landmines, everything else seems pretty doable. Thanks for listening to the show. You can subscribe at Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, please leave us a review. It really does make a difference. Thanks to my amazing staff at Fiori Communications, who pick up the slack while I'm working on these podcasts, and to Troy Bloom for composing our theme music. You can hear more of Troy's creations on Facebook and Instagram at Troy Bloom Music. To connect with the podcast or suggest a future guest, follow us on social media or email us at podcast at fioricommunications.com.